Adam, good afternoon. Billy, how are you? Good. How's my hair? Can't see it from here. Cool. Too good far start. away. Solid. It's not so good. Solid start. Thank you, mate. Thank you. <laughs> Adam, uh, mate, firstly, thank you for your time today. Uh, I've known you a very long time. You're a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, you have a very interesting story. Uh, and from what I know about you through our friendship, uh, the key words that stick out to me about your career are hard work, innovation, family, and Canberra. How, how would, do you think my uh, description there is pretty, pretty apt about your, your start and your career and where you're at now? I think if I wrote a list of the 20 things that have been the dot points that you could probably associate with my career, that would definitely be in the top 10. Top 10. Now, Adam, obviously, uh, you don't need an introduction, so to speak. You are, you are known all the world around for your, for your skills in the hairdressing, styling game. Uh, your career has taken you all around the world. You've won numerous awards uh, and, of course, have set up a very successful salon. Not only a salon, a new salon. Of course, it is still Axis, uh, which is synonymous uh, with, uh, with quality here in Canberra, very much in demand uh, by a very, very large client list. And of course, we'll talk about the new salon and how great that is. But Adam, I want to go back to the start. Now, from what I understand, uh, it is in your family. It is in your genes. I'm not just talking about hard work. I'm talking about hairdressing. So I want to understand where you first developed a passion for hairdressing and then obviously how that became your career, your life's work, and something that you've shared with hundreds, thousands of clients, and even more through your YouTube and social media channels? Look, I think sometimes even I wonder like, wow, how did I end up being a hairdresser? It's, uh, I mean, how much time have we got? So it started with, uh, I think I'd have to go back to like year 11 and 12. And like a lot of young people, you think by then you know what you want to do. And for those who knew me back then, I, maybe similar to a lot of young guys, had a dream of being an athlete. I was very passionate about playing football. And um, I really wanted to try my best to see if that would actually become a reality. And look, I think, um, you know, people who may have played with me said I might have been a decent footballer, but it wasn't going to be a reality. And then from then I was sort of lost. I... Um, I'd unfortunately set myself up to focus on football, therefore I wasn't at that point doing schooling to go to university. And then when year 12 finished, I actually got a job with a company called Biogard. They had an agency at a local pool store here in Canberra and I was focused on doing chemistry, water sanitisation, that sort of stuff. And then I went to CIT and I was studying bookkeeping. And the reason why I did that is because, like every migrant um, family, they wanted their children to go to university because... You know, they didn't have those opportunities and I literally um, had my father give me a big book of the courses you could do at UC and I opened the first couple of pages and put my finger down and, of course, it landed on accounting. So because I didn't do a tertiary package at college, I needed to go and do a bridging course. I did that at CIT and part of that was, like, economics and bookkeeping. And then um, I needed some part-time work because of the hours I was doing at school. I couldn't then continue doing what I was doing with uh, Biogard or was called Pools of Canberra. And um, my dad said to me, well, your sister and her fiancé have just moved to Sydney because he signed a professional basketball contract and your uncle could probably use some help around his salon. So I jumped in my little Mazda 323 and headed into the salon that was on Barry Drive. It started there in 1991. And um, because of... Um, my sister's role in that salon, I tried to assume that role the best I could. So if I can give you some context, I arrived in a pair of baggy blue jeans, the desert boots, the camel colour, and an Adidas T-shirt. <laughs> I don't know whether I, I was... I can't imagine you yeah, in that. I don't know whether I was prepared <laughs> to um, to go into the salon, which was, to Johnny's credit, it was an incredible um, new concept. I mean, he was serving coffee, he was serving uh, champagne, he had European magazines and it was really, really uncomfortable with stepping there and I tried to assume Nicole's role the best I could which was answering the phone, um, greeting clients, helping out with some errands. Um, the plan was for me to start learning to do the wages and paying the bills and the things she was doing um, and I have to be honest it's probably one of the most uncomfortable experiences of my life. People probably expected me to go into doing something like IT my other uncle, my dad's little brother, gave me his first computer when I was probably 
11 or 12 years old, it was an IBM 8086. So its processing speed was it ran at clock speed. <laughs> now we're talking about now we're, we're into the the sort of processing that you know is incredible. Control. So mm. literally a processor goes at clock speed, mm. and he gave me a book that said MS DOS. <laughs> And the other one was QBasic. So by the time I was 13 or 14, I'd, I'd mastered the art of uh, being patient enough to do probably six to eight pages of text so I could play a snake game or paddleboard. You know, there was no memory. So mm. um, I had a little bit of a flair for that. For me, it was more like a hobby, so I never really thought about doing that as a career. So back to Axis, I really struggled for the first six months, and Johnny could see that. So he said, I need you to see into the industry and what it could be. So he sent me to a conference. It was one of the biggest conferences you could go to back then as a hairdresser, and it was run by a company called Goldwell. And what they do is they have these um, conferences where they be, bring all their clients from all over Australia to one place. They have hair shows, the sort of things that I now have the privilege of doing for other people. And um, I watched this man named Robert Labetta, who for me is probably the most visionary hairdresser since Sassoon that's ever lived, and he did a haircut blindfolded. Well, he did a blindfolded haircut. And I'm sitting here as a guy who's come from playing football. Now, I'm looking around going, how good is this beautiful young women all for our industry? And, you know, obviously as a straight guy, that's obviously at that age and my lack of maturity, that was sort of the hook. Mm-hmm. But then I just I just saw the types of characters and different type of people. And then I don't think I've ever been exposed to an industry where you have such an eclectic mix of people. Some of the smartest people I've ever met in my life are hairdressers. I mean super, super intelligent people. And in some of these creatives that I now work with, I don't know how they get their brain to work that way. It has to be something that you're you're born with. So I come back from that conference with this new lease on on life. And um, I was struggling to do that job, but one of the things that it did help me with is automatically I started to change from being this sporty you know athletes dress when they're young you know when you're not going out you're living in track pants and cool sneakers and t-shirts and caps and whatever all of a sudden I was like buying jeans and I wanted to wear button-up shirts and that was that had that influence in me almost immediately and then I was like um still struggling with that job the admin I had like it's a very tough job in hair salon to be a coordinator because there's you know, maybe at that point, Johnny had maybe 10 to 12 people working in, and a little salon was a lot, and all hairdressers work differently. So not only do you have to learn how to book things in, but all hairdressers have different ways of having things booked in. And it wasn't computers, you're writing everything down by pencil in these massive books. So I decided that um, it was not for me, and I resigned. And um, I said to Johnny, I'll, 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 you know, he was a little bit upset about that. He came over to my parents' place where I was still living. He said, what happened? I said, look, it's not for me. I'm really struggling with it. It's maybe, again, I take responsibility for it. It was probably a lack of maturity, um, struggling with navigating around different age girls. And I'd gone into an environment where I needed to learn how to speak nicely around people and, and how to act around women. And I only had a sister who, you know, did teach me a lot about what is and isn't acceptable, but not in sort of being inappropriate, but like how to work in a female dominant environment where I've come from sporting environments where it's very raw, you know, masculine. And um, I just struggled and I said, well, I'll come back, but only if I can be a hairdresser. And he's literally like, what? And um, still to this day, I remember he was like, are you sure? And I'm, yep, I'll come back, but I want to be a hairdresser. So at the age of 21, when I had been managing girls that were 16, I went and I was their subordinate. So I went from the age of 21 being effectively 2IC, even though I wasn't equipped to be a manager of any type, to being a first-year apprentice. Mm. So even I looked back and I thought the courage that it took to actually do that, and I still don't know why I did it, but I tell you, sitting here in front of you right now, I'm glad I did. So from that point, it was, wow, like so much has happened. So, you know, I started training and it was very difficult, Billy, like I... I had no prerequisites to be a hairdresser. You mentioned it was in my family. You could go back to my grandfather when he came to Australia and worked at the Snowman Hydro Scheme of him telling me stories of him barbering people's hair to make a bit of money and then Johnny becoming a hairdresser. But none of those things were connected in terms of a pathway being paved for family members to be hairdressers. It just it could seem that way, but it wasn't like that. And um, I was just so bad at it. Like, I just couldn't get it. And then um, I remember getting to a point of like my second year of my apprenticeship and as you do, you do training and it doesn't go so good. So you go out the back and you want to hide in the hole that you can find. And most apprentices, unfortunately, resort to cleaning when it happens. So I started cleaning the back and I found this this book 
and it was at the bottom of this drawer covered in dust and on the front it said cutting hair the Sassoon way and I picked it up and uh, and I had a bit of a flick through it and one of the things that I was think I've always been sort of a little gifted in is mathematics so Sassoon pioneered the short lady's haircut by using geometry and mathematics so I picked this up and I'm like surely it can't be this easy and then all of a sudden I was like oh wow now that was probably the biggest turning point in my career because the people who'd who had tried to teach me, and, and credit to them, Johnny especially, that was super patient. But some people just don't get it. And I just wasn't getting it, and this was the one thing that just lit the lights up in my, in my eyes. I was like, wow. So then when they say you're creating shape by using angles, line projection, you know, all these mathematical terms that were really easy to me, that was actually then... I knew that I'd made the right decision, but at that point, I was ready to walk. Mm. I can understand that, and certainly it, 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 from the story that you're telling about your life and, and growing up, you were going through such a period of change. I mean, you had an intention of being uh, an athlete. You're obviously, you know, you look after yourself. You know, that was a, that was your your uh, that's where you wanted to head to. You know, in your life, the dream, and the, dream, the dream, exactly yeah. right, the dream. And then through a simple twist of fate, in some ways, not just working for Gianni, but going out. The back, finding that book, feeling at your lowest and feeling that you wanted to quit, but then you found that extra gear. And a lot of people that I talk to um, in a variety of different ways are at that same point. So they're down and out, they're, they're wanting to walk out that door, but when they find that little bit of motivation that pulls them back in, almost like that shining light that goes, hey, don't give up yet. It sounds to me like you had that, but also combined with the fact that you didn't want to let down your uncle, you didn't want to let down your parents. Obviously, the story about your grandfather on the Snowy Hydro was very important to you. So all these factors combined uh, turned into motivation. And then obviously from there, you started this trajectory, um, obviously getting a name for yourself, you're starting to get your own clients, clients that are only wanting to come to you, and, and suddenly it just builds from there. Is that a, is that a fair way to sum it up? I guess I guess that is a fair assessment. Going back to my grandfather, it was like he had no intention to be a hairdresser. It was a matter of being able to make money so he could afford to bring my grandmother and my father out from Italy. Mm. So there was no sort of pathway. Even Johnny left, um, and I mean I'm probably not qualified to answer why he exactly got into hairdressing, um, but uh, for me it was like I'd made this commitment, and there was at that point at Axis there was like eight guys in the team. And I just saw people coming in and having their hair done for them. They were like rock stars. And I'm like, this is actually a really cool environment. And then I was like, this is something I'm just going to see out. Like, I'm going to finish my apprenticeship. I need my qualification because I'm too far down the road now. And you're right about too many people get halfway and they throw the towel in. And it's like, we've sort of wasted two years. Mm. And I thought, well, if I get my qualification, I can throw a backpack on and go and meet some of my mates in Europe and I can cut hair and, and try and survive and then come back and reassess. But from that point, it was um, it was just all systems go. It just really started to snowball from there, as you said. And um, certainly even today, there's still been a lot of uh, hard work to be done. Um, but from that point, it was finished my qualification uh, as a hairdresser. I went on to do my certificate four, which um, was available at that time. So you could increase from your standard... Um, diploma in hairdressing, Cert 3, and I did my Cert 4, so I continued my education. And then starting to build a reputation in uh, Canberra of, you know, pretty decent hair cutter and building my clientele to a point that, gratefully, I was able to save money and then start to, you know, buy a house, move out of home and things like that. I want to fast forward now to a few different areas um, of, uh, of your business and of your life. Now, the first thing is social media, the internet. Now, obviously, that came into play, uh, I guess, as you were doing your training, obviously, as you were getting your experience up. Something that I've always admired about you is that you've really used social media for your benefit in so many ways. Obviously, the product, the service that you provide is very visual. People need to see it. Instagram, YouTube are your prime areas of uh, promotion. Do you feel that you were ahead of the curve? Did you see the real benefits of what social media could do for you, your business, and obviously your profile? Did you see that early on and then invest in that? How did you do that? And obviously, did you see the rewards from that? If I said that I had a... I mean, it could it could appear that way now, but looking back, I mean, if I were to be totally honest, I guess it was just like every other young person embracing something new. And then there were probably two key points. The first one was, yeah, you know, and they're about two years apart. So in 2008, obviously, Instagram was, I'm oh, sorry, Facebook was launched. 
and I'm now in my seventh year of my career, and we incorporated that into our business model. Now, at this point, I'm not an owner of Access, I'm just an employee, and it was suggested I you know, try and encourage the owner of the salon at the time to set up a Facebook page, and, and that wasn't easy. So that was the beginning. So everyone was doing websites, and I, I saw that how Facebook was going to grow very, very quickly. But I think what you're alluding to is exposing your business through content media. Now, when I started YouTube, I actually didn't know what I was doing. So I was in Los Angeles. I just finished my master class at Sassoon, and I was sitting in a bar, I was actually the Viceroy Hotel on, on have you been to the Viceroy? I haven't been to the Viceroy. Super cool, no. super cool hotel on Ocean Ave. And I and I'll never forget her name, her name was Monica. And I was in Santa Monica, so how am I gonna forget her name, right? And I was just talking and um, I said, So what are you doing in LA? And she said, I've just moved here from New York. I was like, Oh, I could well be doing New York. She said, I was a mortgage broker. Now, this is two thousand and ten, two years after the GFC. Mm. I'm thinking, you know, this person's running. And as it turns out, she was telling me that um, she was a mortgage broker and she was making so much money that if she didn't like the colour of a Lamborghini, she'd just change it. So she's doing well for herself. Then GFC hit and like most of them, they ran. She told me that she's now in LA and she's a YouTuber. I'm like, well, I've heard of YouTube. What's a YouTuber? And I didn't know what that meant. She said, well, I now create YouTube videos and I get paid for it. And what I do is I show people how to go to good value stores and combine clothes so it looks like the designer version at a quarter of the price. I said, oh, okay. She said, I really got my break one day when I had this email from someone claiming to be Madonna stylist. And she said, we've seen your stuff on YouTube. We'd like to meet. And she said, I thought that it was, you know, some spam or scam at, at the start. She met with these people and sure enough, they were legit. She ended up doing a world tour with Madonna. And now that was her full-time job. So I was like, wow, what a story. So um, went out to dinner with some colleagues from Sassoon, and that was the last ever saw her. I was thinking about it on the plane and thought, I wonder if I can do that for hair. And it was literally just a thought. So I arrived back in Canberra, and what I like to do is when I go overseas and learn these things, I like to bring them back and share them with my team, mm -hmm. as we do. Obviously, sharing is key to any industry, making sure we all grow, keep it sustainable. Um, the iPhone, I don't know if you guys remember the iPhone, you couldn't send a picture message on. Do you remember that? We all oh, have one. I don't. Why we, why we bought that? It's like, I'll just email my pictures to my friends later. I don't need to MMS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can literally go to a post office and buy a phone. You could send a picture message. Do you remember that? that I do. I do remember those times. Absolutely a long bogus. time ago, yeah. So um, there, I still remember the girl. Her name was Jessie. I said, Jessie, can you grab my phone? I want you to film me doing this haircut because um, a couple of the guys couldn't stay back. And I wanted to share it with them. So halfway through it, she goes, Adam, your phone's out of memory. I'm like, of course it is. So what am I going to do now? So I didn't want to delete my photos. So at that point, YouTube hadn't acquired, hadn't been acquired by Google. They had an exclusive arrangement with Apple that the option button, so the square with the arrow, you pressed it and it said, uh, email, save, send to YouTube. So I'm like, brilliant. I'll just send that footage to YouTube. <coughs> and then what I can do is um, upload it, done, delete it, keep going. That literally took 10 minutes to do. It was so quick. And um, that was the last thought of it. Deleted the footage, kept going. So that was a Saturday afternoon. Now, I wake up on the Sunday with my then beautiful girlfriend, now wife, Michelle, and I've got all these notifications on my phone. I'm like, what, what's going on on my phone? Now, at that point, the app was very clunky. The functionality was bad. So I got to my computer later on that day when I got back home, and it was just hundreds and hundreds of comments on this one haircut uploaded. Now, if you look at my channel, it's still there. Mm. The original video upload is still there. And um, it was like, thank you so much for sharing this. I tried it on my client today and they rebooked. Um, I really love this technique. She looked great. Um, you don't know what you're talking about. You're an idiot. Go kill yourself. Like, <laughs> I learned very, very quickly how brutal social media was, but I never focused on a negative, just a positive. I'm like, I, th I think very deeply about things and I'm like, what does this actually mean? And I'm looking literally, Billy, it's been uploaded for 12 hours and I had like five or 6,000 views and hundreds of comments. And I'm like, there are people in parts of the world for either financial reasons or because they're in a remote location, they haven't been able to access the education I've been privileged enough to be given. So I'm like, all right, this is actually what I'm, this is actually like a sign. I know that sounds self-righteous, 
But no, but like, it falls in line with your experiences up till now. It does, and I just thought, mm. well, you can't do everything for money because I had no idea that there would be some at some point financial benefits. I'm going to do this for my soul. I've been fortunate for people to share their knowledge with me, and I'm going to share my knowledge with others. And if they choose to consume it um, or not, that's up to them. So to the beginning of your question, uh, did I have some plan or see the future? I had no idea what I was doing. However, the reality was in three years' time from that point, we had moved from Barry Drive to Lonsdale Street and respectfully there was nothing broken about the business. It was very successful but we doubled it. Mm. It doubled. So we were able to take a thriving successful business, double the team and double the turnover all because of YouTube. Or because of YouTube, the, the money from that gave... Not from YouTube, but the exposure that it gave the, the exposure, brand. exposure, sorry. So, so people were coming in, they weren't just Canberra clients. They were clients from all, all over around the place. Sydney. Some, some international beyond. clients. Wow, would and fly it was in. Like, I remember it dawned on me what was happening because originally I set out to share my knowledge with hairdressers. Mm. But once Google then acquired YouTube, they were indexing video results in a search engine. So if you type short haircut, all the videos that were uploaded and got into that algorithm early, they were actually getting priority in search results. So people were clicking on our video and the people clicking on them weren't hairdressers, they were clients. Mm. So for me to say that I knew that was going to happen would be a blatant lie. Mm. So again, I just, and like all people should, is embrace technology, see how you can work it into your business. And if it's not working, it's not working. But don't discount anything because you think, oh, it's not for us or whatever. And that's all I did. I was a young guy. I was wet behind the ears. I had some raw but sort of decent skills at that point. And I just thought I'd share them with people. Little did I know that consumers would be like consuming that content on YouTube and that would then make them come into our business. You have a, clearly a passion for what you do. You have a, a, a passion for always striving to be the best, be cutting edge, be innovative and provide the best service for your clients. My question is, and again, just based on that answer that you gave, how do you take ego out of it? How do you ins- like to make sure that you're doing the best for that specific client's needs because every client is different? And when you see feedback, you mentioned some of that feedback you got in your videos. Does that does that deter you? Does that does that does that hurt? Does that hit hard, or do you are you so strong and conditioned that you're like you know what you're always going to get that in life? You're always going to get people that don't like what you do or the service that you perform, but you just keep going. Does that make sense? Look, I, I would like to think well. I think every human being has an ego. I mean, I would like to think that I'm not driven by mine and I think people who know me best would would probably agree. Um, And I learned at a very young age to stop making decisions predicated on the opinions of others because if that was the case, I would have moved out of town a long time ago. Um, I think that um, you always focus on the positive, block out the negative. And if you're, you know, I think if you're doing... 10 things and six of them are great and one of them is all right and the other three are bad, I think you're ahead of the game. I never never worried about what other people thought because I wasn't doing it for me. I think you should always share without expectation and I always have. I didn't didn't realise that there would be a financial benefit to doing all this content. You couldn't monetise videos when I uploaded them because you had to get to, I think at that point it was like 10,000 subscribers or something like that. I was so far off that happening. So I, I, never, I never worried about it. Maybe it was a bit of ignorance is bliss. But I, I was lucky that I had a, and still do, have a very supportive partner and I didn't really concern myself with negativity and still don't. I think it can actually, it can, it can actually be really consuming. It can make you feel really dark and lonely in life. So I just... Lucky that I had strong parents that taught me that. Mm. Just don't worry about what others are saying. So let's get to, of course, your uh, your, your amazing new facility that you've got here uh, in uh, still Braddon, isn't it called? Yeah, we're still in Braddon. Still in Braddon. Uh, you've opened this beautiful new salon. Uh, it's been open now for about three, four maybe months, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. And, of course, you were mentioning to me off camera, the, sorry, off mic, that you wanted to have a bit of a stripped-down version, very simple, very plain, very elegant. Uh, so, A, have you achieved that? B... You, all your clients have still stuck with you. Your clients are very loyal. I mean, I want to talk about that in another question, but, of course, everyone has come across. What's the feedback been like? And, of course, what's uh, in store for the new salon? Is there, is there any updates that you'd like to provide here? Um, well, maybe some context first. So, obviously, we'd moved from Barry Drive in 2012, 13. Uh, we arrived on Lonsdale Street in 2013. And, um, look, I think um, the salon that we built there was spectacular and credit to 
my former business partner, he built a beautiful salon. Unfortunately, due to many reasons, uh, our business there was no longer tenable. Um, and so when you have to make a change to do what you've always been doing and just put in another spot, it could sometimes be a missed opportunity. So I sat down with Michelle and our two incoming new business partners and we had a chat about the things that we loved about where we were and the things that we thought probably needed to be updated, reinvented or scrapped altogether. Now, I think from the outset, I think Access as a brand, we have gone for a few different rebrandings with the help of um, some very important people in town. And I've listened to your previous podcast about branding and I agree with some of the things James said. So one of the things we wanted to do is go back to our boutique roots. So coming from Barry Drive, we had a very specialised, small team focused on delivering high-quality uh, hairdressing services. And now when we had three business partners on Lonsdale Street, myself, Nicole and Johnny, we had income expectations and you need to turn over a certain amount of money to meet those expectations. And I think it got away away from us a little bit. It was a beast. You know, at one point we had 24 staff. You know, 24 staff, what that feels like. Mm. Like, it's it's madness. And um, I always thought bigger would be better. And I take fault for that because um, I was given the privilege of being able to buy the majority share in 2014 and be the managing partner, and it was up to me. So I grew this team to this, and they were all talented, and some of them have now gone on to open their own salons in Canberra, something I'm very proud of, and um, I congratulate all of them. But I think what we realised is, like, this is not sustainable. Like, at some point, like, this is going to break. So where we find ourselves now is uh, at the grounds at Braddon, and um, we've taken the best of access and we've looked at the things that maybe didn't work, and um, we went back to a more boutique name. So it was Access Hairdressing on Barry Drive. We changed it to Access Hair on Lonsdale Street and now it's Access Salon. So I think that where we are now, where we're at as a business is a back to almost our original roots where I did my apprenticeship because I think it was a, it was a great environment for people to learn. Where we were, it was so busy. We had so many staff. I don't think it was a great place for people to learn. And again, I put my hand up for that because you have to prioritise doing clients and keeping the money coming in because you've got bills. Like, it's it's a beast. You have to of keep course. feeding it, right? So we've taken ourselves back to the roots of Axis. And I have to say, I didn't create Axis. Um, I had the privilege of working there. Uh, 1991 it started, so I started there in 99, so eight years after they found their feet. Johnny created it. Uh, incredible, like, brand ethos. It's really simple. Be, be a decent human for a start. And I think that's a super important part of any business is if you can just be a decent human, most other things take care of themselves. I think the brand values of Access have been forged by former, present and clients to come. So I can't take the credit for the brand values. Brand values are dictated by the expectations of staff when they work there and clients when they have their head on there. So we've taken all that and, and considered all that and taken access back to its roots. So we've got a more modern environment. Hopefully it doesn't feel like a salon when you come in. It's meant to feel like a home. One of the th- one of the, the key European values is you don't want when someone <laughs> when someone would come to my house and I knew who they were and they rang the doorbell, if I said, Yep, no worries, I'll let my dad know you're here and leave him at the front door, do you know what happened to me? Mm, I can have a guess. Well, we can welcome people into your house. So mm. one of the feedback we got from Access on Lonsdale Street is it was an intimidating environment because it was spectacular. It was grand. And credit to Johnny, like that was that was like a, it was a symbol of like where he was at in his in his career, and he wanted to build something that represented him. But that doesn't represent us anymore. Mm. So we've gone back to our humble beginnings because we're at different points in our career. So it's like we want people to come in and feel like they're at home. We don't even have a reception area in our new salon. We don't need one. So people come in now and I think it's far more inviting. Not that the other place wasn't, but if you're a young person, I'll give you a really an analogy. So I don't know if you've ever walked into, like, for the first time, if you ever walked into Louis Vuitton or Hermes or Prada. I remember when I walked into Versace for the first time to buy my wedding suit. I ended up buying from John Hanna, God bless his soul. Um... But I couldn't walk in there. I was so scared to walk in mm. there. It's not because it's a bad place or because it was a, you know, it put you off. It was just, it's, it takes a, 
a lot of courage to walk in here because, like, can I afford this? Am I good enough to be here? And when I got some of this feedback from some of our younger staff who queried some of their friends, I was like, I had no idea it was being perceived that way. So we took all that into consideration. And look, if we had an endless amount of money, which we didn't, we probably would have built it a little bit different. But given we just come out of a pandemic um, when we had to move very quickly, I'm really proud of what we built. I, I let Michelle really drive the design with uh, Louise um, from LB Design. She's amazing. And what we have now is a wide open space. We have a common table for people to have their colour at. Um, we don't have any segregation. We have beautiful natural light on Donaldson Street. So you're sitting in the salon, green grass, blue skies, nice trees. And that, it, for me, it feels somewhat suburban, which I like. You'd think you maybe you are on the edge of the city there, but you're in a suburban street too. Mm-hmm. So all those things were strategic. And we're just very fortunate we stumbled across that location and um, we could afford to buy it. So I'm happy, I'm happy where we're at now. Now you manage, you've managed people uh, for, for many, many years. You have a, uh, you've had a big team um, that have followed you, been very loyal uh, in part. And I want to understand what is the secret to managing a successful team? Uh, I know some of the people that work with you have been with you for 10, 15 years, give or take. Uh, and how do you inspire innovation uh, in, your, in your employees? Hmm. So as a leader, I think I've... I actually don't think I was a very good leader. I actually think I was a very poor leader. And I think that's a, that's very hard for a lot of people to admit. And I think that there's a lot of reasons for that. I never really felt like I could lead. I was in an environment where maybe I felt like I was trying to live up to some expectation that might have been in my head. It could have been real. So I got to the point where I was like, what what are you doing? Like, I was just, I wasn't living my truth. I wasn't being true to myself. And I think that, you know, we all live in a world where there's filters and we're trying to front and pretend to be who we weren't. So the first part of being a good leader, I just had to find out who I really was. And that's hard, you know, especially, you know, I'm, I'm 44. You know, I, I don't think I realised or could admit to myself that until I was probably in my mid-30s, which is, you know, I'd already been doing hairdressing one 15 years since then. So I think I've got to a point as a leader where you need to be strong, especially through a pandemic, I can tell you that. When you've got 18 people looking at you frightened and you're shitting yourself yourself, you've got to be brave. Mm. But we, not, we didn't have any idea what was going on. So I think leaders must always show strength that, is, that it has a foundation of compassion. Now, strength is not like staunch, hard, you know, you know being... Uh, passive, aggressive or any of those things, which I'm probably guilty of being in the past. Strength is like you need to be courageous, you need to have, um, you need to be brave. And then first and foremost, you need to know how to deploy empathy and be compassionate to people. And I'd be like, wh- why, why aren't people like me? Why doesn't everyone want what I want? Because when we're all different and that's actually why I started hairdressing, if you remember this conversation. It's because I'd walked into an industry, I was like, I just expected everyone to be the same. There's so many different types of people in the hairdressing industry. So reflecting on my career and like, hang on, why did I go away from my, you know, the thing that inspired me to be in the hairdressing? I don't know. But I now found, find myself leading with compassion, courage, and the need to be brave and you need to deploy empathy and understand that people have different motivations for coming to work and that's okay. It's a, a good leader will find how to actually bring the best out of everyone. You can't expect everyone to be the same. Can you imagine if you had four Billy Bradleys at the radio? God, we'd be pretty lucky. <laughs> well, I can tell you, sell them with four Adam Chachas in it would be pretty hard for the best manager to, of course. to manage. But yeah. innovation obviously drives everything we do. Mm. And although, you know, we've been sp- speaking about how back in 2008 I... Um, And I did have struggles to get the the management at that point to allow innovation to lead the brand. I've stepped out of the way. I've I've stepped back and I allow the girls who are just incredible at creating content, it's like just stepping back and saying, hey, you guys know this better than me because it evolves so fast. And then you'd see yourself to say, put your hand up and say you know everything or you can stay on top of the game. Um, It's just false. So I think to allow innovation into your business you first must allow a collective input 
on how that innovation drives your business. And um, again, listening to a previous podcast with James, he's done a great job here doing the same thing. He comes in and, and I try and do the same thing. So, hey guys, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? We've got that beautiful table in the middle of the salon. Mm. We quite often have a coffee there on a, on a morning at nine o'clock and we're just bouncing ideas off each other and the guys there are driving it. So I can't say that I'm doing that anymore. One of the things that I did acknowledge very, very quickly is I think that maybe things could have been very different if I was allowed to spread my wings earlier. So I think that when you've learned from the past, if I were to do the same thing to the people I work with today, I'd be a fool. So I'm not saying anyone previously is a fool, but I get out of their way. I let them spread their wings. And if we make a mistake or if it's not right, that's where my experience comes in to help, you know, with like changing the direction of that innovation. Mm. Well, I think we're just almost out of time, but of course, there were so many more questions that I had for you, Adam. I know that you've got a lot on, uh, but of course, I wanted to talk about your, your numerous awards. I wanted to talk about, obviously, the direction forward for access and your own creative channels in so many ways. But I think what we've done here today is we've really focused on your story. That's the most important thing for this conversation. It's about learning about people's background, how they chose the direction that they chose, uh, how they innovate, how they stay educated, informed. And you've answered all those questions for me today. And I think some of the highlights for me are right at the beginning where you really you had a, an idea of what you wanted to achieve. You had no idea what was going to happen the next day and obviously the years ahead, which they have, uh, and the success that you would experience and the people that you've inspired, the people that you've helped. I think that's the big thing. I think what sometimes people forget with you, what you do is that you're actually helping people. You're helping people with their self-confidence. You're helping people to, to treat themselves. You're helping people in so many more ways that we do talk about now in the public very, very openly, like mental health and, and all those sort of factors. But what what you actually do in so many ways is doing that. And I think it's it's more than a haircut. I think it's actually a check-in. I think it's, you know, how you're feeling, getting to know them. It's friendship. It's connection. I think they get that with that one-on-one with you uh, and, of course, your, your wonderful team at Axis. So I've taken a lot away from here today. As I said, I've known you a very long time, but there was stuff that I learned today that I didn't know about you, and I think it's been fascinating. And I what I like this podcast to do, as I said, is to inspire others. So if you if you have an idea and you think it's stupid – is it stupid and what are you going to do about it? And I think that's exactly what you've done. The only stupid idea is the one you don't try. That's exactly right. Adam Chacha, thank you so much for your time. We cannot wait to see all your amazing work across all your channels. Of course, go in and see the team at Access Salon but all, and then in their brand new uh, uh, salon at the gardens, I believe. Uh, the grounds. The, the grounds, grounds, sorry. The grounds, we'll edit that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the grounds on the edge of the city. Of course, you can uh, subscribe to Adam's YouTube channel, uh, his Instagram. You can see everything he's up to, his wonderful team and the amazing work that they are doing. Adam, thank you for your time today. It's a pleasure, mate. Good to see you again.